So, now we uh, uh, the, the second part of this lecture we come uh, we talk about the uh, difference between the real retention and observed retention. First of all, it is observed retention is directly measurable, experimentally measurable. This is not, not directly measurable. Second one is that uh, it can be used for modeling purposes, cannot be used for modeling purposes simply because uh, actually between the two things, this is, this is C naught bulk concentration, there is a concentration gradient exists that is C m and you will be having a permeate concentration in the permeate side is C p. So, between C naught and C p there exists the concentration boundary layer or mass transfer boundary layer wh which the observed retention it does not include. So, because of this fact it is known as the observed retention this is known as the real retention. So, observed retention the definition 1 minus C naught by, by C p the permeate concentration will be entirely depending on the operating conditions right. What are the operating conditions in typical membrane based processes? First is the fit concentration. If you fix your effluent, fit concentration is fixed. So, forget about fit concentration if you fix your effluent because the concentration is fixed. And what are the other, other operating conditions? The other two operating conditions are one is the pressure difference delta p across the membrane. Third one is the extent of turbulence that means Reynolds number that you are going to have in the system. Okay. You can have a start cell in the start cell uh, the, the because depending on the starter speed you can have the turbulence or if you have a cross flow cell we will discuss all these geometries later on. If you have a cross flow cell the linear velocity will define the uh, Reynolds number. Okay. So, depending on the operating conditions the permeate concentration will change. So, therefore, permeate concentration includes the variation of operating conditions. So, that cannot give the exact you know um, uh, the uh, separation extent of separation by the membrane that is um, uh, uh, that has the affinity for that particular solute. So, real iteration is in the definition is gives the actual separating separation capability of a particular membrane towards a solute that is why it is called a real retention. So, R R quantifies exact separation capacity of a solute uh, of a membrane towards a solute. Okay. Uh, so, it, it give it is basically nothing but and it is constant for a particular membrane solute solvent system. Okay. So, that is the beauty of real retention. So, it is constant for a particular membrane solute uh, solvent system. For example, if we have an aqueous solution of polyethylene glycol let us say 600 and if we have a uh, membrane let us say uh, some, some kind of membrane, okay, the real retention can be 0.8. But using the same membrane, if you use a different solute for example, let us say dextran, the real retention can be something else. 0.1 or let us say 0.5. And this value of real retention is fixed for a particular membrane solute system and mostly we are talking about the aqueous solution the solvent is more or less water. 
Okay. So, for different solutes and membranes combination, the real value of the real tension becomes constant. So, it becomes an intrinsic property of the membrane towards a particular solute. Okay. So, real tension is constant and uh, if you look into the definition of real retention, it gives a, so it is basically a fundamental property of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the polymer film towards the solute and it gives a partition coefficient, it is just like a partition coefficient of the membrane between the two phases, right, of the solute between the two phases in the upstream side and in the downstream side. It gives a relationship or a partitioning value of the solute uh, in the uh, upstream side of the membrane and in the downstream side of the membrane. So, this is a very gross assumption. Okay. Uh, one can, so this real retention, uh, so it is basically a very gross assumption, it is very simplistic version of the pore flow modeling. If you would like to have a detailed you know, modeling or detailed you know, um, understanding of transport of the solutes to the membrane pores, one has to go for the pore, something called pore flow modeling which is beyond the scope of this particular course, we may not be discussing it. But the easiest way to define the uh, value of the solute upstream and downstream of the membrane by defining a partition coefficient. And that partition coefficient is constant for a particular membrane solute system <coughs> and the simplest definition is real retention. Okay. So, real retention has great implication uh, as far as the modeling of the systems are concerned or design of the system is concerned and see RR is always greater than observed retention R naught because CM is greater than C naught. Okay. Now, next definition that we come across is molecular weight cutoff. Now, molecular weight cutoff is basically a gross interpretation or gross meaning of pore size of the membrane. Now, it is very difficult to find out the pore size of the membrane. There are various methods, for example, scanning electron micrography and various other methods are available for, uh, you know, to, for carrying out the uh, pore size distribution of the membranes. Now, membranes cannot be having a single pore, there will be a distribution of the pores and the average pore size is reported. You require a sophisticated instrument and costly instrument which will be in the, which, whose cost will be in the order of 40 to 50 lakhs for measurement of the pore size distribution of a particular polymeric membrane. Now, the easiest way to find out the, uh, you know, suppose you are going to develop some membrane in a laboratory and try to characterize what cutoff of the membrane is, okay, what will be rough poly, uh, pore size of the membrane is. The, 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 the way to define is molecular weight cutoff. A membrane is having 1000 molecular weight cutoff means it will retain solutes which will be having molecular weight above 1000. Okay. Above 1000 and it can uh, permeate and it will permeate solutes with molecular weight less than 1000. So, that, that means it is a 1000 molecular weight cutoff. Now, how to find out the molecular weight cutoff curve or how to, how to determine the molecular weight cutoff of a particular membrane that is very important and it is quite crucial as far as the membrane researchers are concerned. <coughs> so, what one has to do? One has to prepare a solution of various molecular weights, solution of solutes having different molecular weights. For example, I will prepare, suppose I have prepared a membrane. I will prepare solution of let us say 10 percent solution or 1 percent solution of various solutes having molecular weight. Let us say first molecular weight I will be taking 58.5 uh, that is sodium chloride, right. Next let us say glucose, glucose is having molecular weight around 180. Sucrose which will be having a molecular weight of 342. PEG of various molecular weights are available 200, 400, 600, 1000, 1500, okay, 2000 like that, PEG 4000, 6000, 10000, 30000, 
various molecular weights of polyethylene glycol fractions are available. Similarly, you can have dextran fraction, dextran is again a polysaccharide, dextran, okay. it has different molecular weights, let us say 10,000, 40,000, 40k, 70k, 1.5 lakhs. Okay. So, what we will do and, and generally this molecular cutoff curves are generated by using neutral solute that is quite important. Sodium chloride is not a neutral solute, it is a, it is a, it is a simplest possible electrolyte you can think of. Okay. But other molecules like glucose, sucrose, various molecular of polyethylene glycol, dextran all are neutral solute, they are not charged. Why they are uh, using neutral solutes and uh, why not charged solutes for uh, doing the molecular cutoff characteristic curves? Simply because uh, some of the membranes, when you are talk, talking about the polymeric membranes, some of the membranes are become membrane, membranes are become membrane matrix are becomes charged. So the pores are becomes charged. So the in the very long, very small distance, the charge charge interactions and electro electric uh, properties of this uh, sub, uh, between solutes and the membrane matrix become very important. Okay, Debye length and things like that that we will talk about later on. All these things become very important, charge charge interactions become very important when to, we talk about a uh, very small distances. Okay. So, therefore, uh, those can have an effect on the separation characteristic. So, that is why the charged molecules are generally avoided in creating or characterizing the molecular weight cutoff curves. What we do? We generally use the neutral solutes like glucose, sucrose, polyethylene, glycol, dextran, various fractions of dextran, so on and so forth. Now, we prepare solution of this very small uh, of uh, let us say 1 percent solution of all this molecular weight of uh, materials. Okay. So, so you have let us say you have 7 or 8 or 10 of these polymers, so you prepare 1 percent solution for all, all of them, each of them say so let us say 10 solutions. Then using a test, test cell, a typical test cell looks like this. It, it, it is a it is a body it is a cylindrical cell uh, shell and it has a body and in the in the in the bottom there is a uh, you know disc is there and you can put a disc membrane the lower portion of this uh, flange is curved it is basically uh, you know uh, corrugated so that the uh, if the permit that is coming out it can go through it okay then it is pressurized by nitrogen cylinder And you put a stirrer. Okay, why you put a stirrer? Simply because uh, to uh, to uh, avoid the deposition over the membrane surface. Okay, to minimize it, you cannot avoid it completely. To minimize it, now using various molecular weight, you measure the uh, retain. Uh, you you carry out this um, experiment. This is it is called start cell experiment. You carry out this experiment with solutions of different molecular weights and measure the permeate concentration. The filter that is coming measure the permeate concentration. Once you measure the permeate concentration, you know the, uh, the fit concentration. Okay. So, you can find out the observed retention 1 minus C p by C naught. Now, in this case, uh, you have to have very high stirring speed to avoid the uh, polarization over the membrane surface, so that you can assume that over this cell, over the volume of the fit, the concentration is more or less uniform. Okay. Now, you plot the observed retention versus molecular weight in a semi log scale. This is in logarithmic scale, this is in normal scale. So, it is a semi log scale. Now, if you plot the observed retention versus molecular weight of, of the solute of that membrane, you, will, you are going to get a curve something like this. Okay. This is 1, 1 means 100 percent retention. Okay. There is no uh, solute that coming in the <coughs> permeate. And in this S shaped curve, the value corresponding to 90 percent separation is supposed to be a molecular weight cutoff of the membrane. Okay. Suppose this molecular weight turns out to this molecular weight turns out to be let us say 30,000, then we call the membrane as 30,000 molecular weight cutoff membrane. The, because you have to you have to fix some value 0 0.9 0 0.95 
or 0.98 something like that. It is a general norm, it is a heuristic or it is a thumb rule that when the value of uh, the corresponding to the molecular weight, uh, the molecule value of the molecular weight corresponding to the uh, observed tension of 0.9 will be termed as the molecular weight cutoff. Okay. Now, these molecular weight cutoff curves can be of two types. It's, it can be a diffused cutoff membrane that means this, this, the, uh, this is spread out okay? and it is known as diffused cutoff membrane and this is called a sharp cutoff membrane. That means, if I talk about a uh, membrane of a molecular weight 10,000 cutoff, that is 10,000 may not be very sharp. That means, it, it can retain molecular weights um, uh, 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 10,000 or 9,000 even. So, that is called a diffused cutoff membrane and this cutoff is a, st a stiff or, a, or, or it is a sharp cutoff membrane. Now, whether you will be getting the sharp cutoff membrane or whether you will be getting the diffused cutoff membrane, that will be entirely depending on the pore size distribution of the membrane. Now, one has to control the pore size distribution. How to control the pore size distribution? You can tinker the casting conditions of the membrane and can uh, vary the pore size of the membrane and you can optimize the whole system can make it a can, can make it a standardized rule. What are the various conditions of the casting solution, casting composition, solution composition, type of solvent you are using, whether you are using a DMF or whether you are using a acetone that, that depends, concentration of that time of evaporation uh, uh, and time of expo exposure to the uh, ice water bath, temperature of aniline, duration of aniline. All these are various conditions of the, all these are various casting conditions. By tinkering or by changing these casting conditions, one can have various molecular weight uh, pore size distribution and one can land up with various molecular weight cutoff of the membrane. Okay. Okay. Now, there are for, for any any modeling purpose or for a forget about modeling for if you look into the performance of a membrane there are two things one has to look into these two things are one is productivity another is the quality Productivity means how much filtrate rate you are going to get. Let us say volumetric filtrate rate meter cube per meter square second or liter per meter square hour okay. and quality is the permeate concentration. These two are the performance indicating parameters of any membrane based separation <coughs> process. Now, in order to get these values, there are two definitions which are indicative. Which are these two definitions? One is the permeability. Permeability of the membrane, another, another is the observed retention. Or, or real retention. Observed retention is a vague thing. So, real retention is the actual one. Permeability indicates how porous your membrane is. That means, if we talk about a membrane of higher permeability, you are going to get high productivity. Okay. And real retention of the membrane means, if the real retention is, is very high, the membrane is very selective to the particular solute that means, retention will be very high. Okay. That means, for real value of real retention 1, that means, your Cp is equal to 0. That means, you are not going to you are not going to get any solute in the permeate stream, the membrane retains everything. For the value of uh, for such case, for the when it is uh, pure water in the downstream in the permeate stream, value of both real retention and observed retention are equal to 1. Now, therefore, real retention is directly related to the quality of the 
membranes uh, performance. So, these two parameters productivity and quality are directly related to the two properties of the intrinsic property of the membranes, one is the permeability, another is the real retention. So, therefore, whenever you are trying to design a membrane based processes or trying to predict the system performance, one has to look into independently determine these two properties, one is the membrane permeability, another is the real retention. The notation that is used for the real retention is RR, another is the membrane and for membrane permeability it is known as LP. Okay. Now, there are there are uh, you know independent methods by which one can determine the value of membrane permeability and determine the value of real retention separately. Now, we are going to discuss these methods. Membrane permeability is basically uh, uh, any any flux is proportional to the driving force. That is called you know uh, uh, that, that is a physical law. Okay, so we call permeate flux that is the productivity of the process. Permeate flux is meter cube per meter square second or liter per meter square hour is proportional to the driving force. Driving force is delta p in this case and the proportionality constant is permeability. Okay. Now, if you are talking about a about pure solution, pure water, pure solvent, okay, there is nothing called pure solution. If it is a pure solvent, then there is no osmotic pressure present in it. If there is a solution, then it, the osmotic pressure will be there and you, you have to overcome that osmotic pressure. So, the effective operating transmembrane pressure drop will be delta p minus delta pi. So, there will be minus delta pi here if you are talk about talking about the presence of any solution. For, for pure solvent pi is equal to 0, there is no question of delta pi. So, V w is equal to L p times delta pi. Okay. This is known as a phenomenological equation. Phenomenological equation means any phenomena can in this universe can be explained that the flux is proportional to a driving force. Okay, that is a phenomena. Now, now it is very simple how to once you know this definition, it is very simple to find out the membrane permeability. What to do? Basically, use the same starch cell and use water instead of use pure solvent instead of the solution and conduct the experiment under different operating pressure okay, and measure the permeate flux and plot the permeate flux versus delta p. You take pure water or pure solvent, carry out the experiment under various operating pressures and for a particular pressure you measure the permeate flux and similarly you, you, you can generate a data of permeate flux at various operating pressures. Then plot these values, let us say there, there will be something like this and then draw a straight line among them it must be going through the origin. Okay, this must be going through the origin. Then slope of this curve will give you the membrane permeability. Okay. So, one has to conduct experiments using pure solvents at various operating transmembrane pressures, measure the permeate flux, plot the permeate flux versus delta p. It has to be a straight line through origin. The uh, slope of that straight line will give the perme membrane permeability. And you need not to give a stirrer speed, you need not to give anything because uh, there is no polarization here because there is no solute present there. Okay. It is very simple experiment, one can get the permeability and most of the cases um, uh, uh, if, if you conduct these experiments, you will be inherently getting a straight line, there is absolutely no problem. Now, the second definition, the second quantity, the real retention experimental det determination of real retention is a bit complicated. Okay. In this case, what you do is that uh, in, uh, There is the polarization, let us define the polarization. 
and this polarization is basically in this case concentration polarization. I will talk about it in more detail later on. Now, as I said earlier that since there is a uh, you know in this in this process the concentration of the solutes over the membrane surface is higher compared to the concentration of the solute in the feed. So, there exists a concentration gradient this is this phenomena is known as the concentration polarization the accumulation of solutes over the membrane surface is known as the concentration polarization. Now, there is no way to determine the membrane surface concentration right directly there is direct experimental measurement. Okay. It is a it is an active field of research people are trying to find out the membrane surface concentration. Now, uh, what what is generally done? We carry out the experiments at low polarization conditions. There are two things one is high polarization condition and low polarization condition. Let us define high polarization and low polarization. This high polarization and low polarization, polarization are directly related to the value of membrane surface concentration. If the membrane surface concentration is high, we call that condition as a high polarization condition. High polarization condition will be will be will be obtained when you are talking about high concentration of the solute in the feed, uh, high value of delta p, and low value of turbulence, low Reynolds number. If you have high value of concentration in the feed under pressure gradient, more solutes will be transported to the membrane surface. So, increasing the membrane surface concentration. If you are talking about high delta p, because the, con the rate of convection will be more and more solutes will be again coming to the membrane surface causing its high uh, increasing the surface concentration. If we talk about the low Reynolds number, that means the surface concentration will be it will not be taken away. Low, low Reynolds number means the uh, it, the, uh, the scarring of the this thing will be less, the solutes will be less. So, they, the membrane surface concentration will be pretty high. So, low polarization condition means we are talking about concentra low concentration, low pressure, reverse of this and high turbulence. So, therefore, if we carry out an experiment in a small stirred cell under low operating uh, low feed concentration and lower delta p or transmembrane pressure drop and at very high stirring speed what it does it mixes up everything whatever what is deposited over the membrane surface so throughout the whole feed chamber the concentration remains more or less constant right in this case in such case you conduct the experiment you carry out the experiment at very low at low polarization conditions and measure the permeate concentration what that permeate concentration will give that will give you observed retention right 1 minus C p by C naught. But in this case C naught is roughly is, is equal to C m because membrane surface concentration and bulk concentration are more or less same. So, therefore, the R naught value the observed retention value that you are getting under this condition will be almost equal to real retention value. So, therefore, real retention of a membrane and a solute can be obtained if you conduct experiments under low polarization conditions and in that case the observed retention will be equal to real retention. Now, when you so it and since real retention is a constant property of the membrane and solute it can be freely used once determined for the various other operating conditions. Okay. Okay. Now, this makes the full background of the you know, first end or first generation model for design. Let us call it first generation model or the simplest model for design. Okay. So, this model is nothing but a one dimensional model. <coughs> and what we assume here the assumption is basically the solutes will produce a constant film over the membrane surface. So, 
solutes depositing over the membrane surface will produce a, a film of constant thickness. Okay. So, there will be, so there will be a concentration gradient present from C bulk to membrane surface concentration, then they are coming out to be permeate site. Now, what is wrong with this? This is the first generation model. What is wrong with this? The, the error involved here is that mass transfer boundary. So, this is basically thickness of concentration boundary layer. Concentration boundary layer or mass transfer boundary layer. The assumption is that we are we are assuming a constant thickness of this boundary layer. Actually, this boundary layer, the mass transfer boundary layer, or concentration boundary layer, if you plot as a function of x the channel length, it will be something like this. Okay, and we are talking about the later half portion where the thickness is constant. Okay. So, in this assumption, this is known as the film, since this we, call, we consider in this case constant thickness of the film, we this, this theory is known as the film theory. Okay. Film theory is the first and the simplest model for you know attempted towards the uh, design of any membrane based separation processes. Now, uh, I will just uh, try to give an idea what is the <coughs> shortcoming of uh, this first generation model. The mass transfer boundary layer, the, the developing region is called uh, the you know uh, entrance length, right? Entrance length for the mass transfer boundary layer, and this is a fully developed mass transfer boundary layer. So, we are assuming, so therefore, in this case where the developing mass transfer boundary layer the thickness of mass transfer boundary layer will be small and it is gradually increasing. Since the thickness is small, it will be offering low resistance against the solvent flux. So, initially, initial of the channel will be giving, you will be getting high permeate flux or high productivity. Later on, it will be decreasing gradually once you, once the mass transfer boundary layer grows and when it becomes fully developed, it becomes constant. That is how whenever you are using the film theory, you are not counting the initial portion of the permeate flux. So, therefore, uses, use, use of film theory will be always giving you under prediction of the permeate flux, because you are overlooking the de mass developing mass transfer boundary layer and that region will be substantial. If you remember the transport phenomena class that I have taken for you in probably in the last to last year, that if you talk about the hydrodynamic boundary layer, that means velocity boundary layer, the entrance length is given as L e by d will be will be equal to 0 0.05 Reynolds number, right. And since we in this case we are talking about very thin channel and maximum Reynolds number under laminar flow condition will be around 2000 or 2200 the L e will be turns out to be 4 to 6 centimeter. So, therefore, for the channels, the channels in the, in the membrane uh, separation units we are talking about with that thickness the equivalent diameter, the entrance length for the hydrodynamic boundary layer becomes 4 to 6 centimeter only, whereas the full channel length will be in meters, will be 100 centimeter, 200 centimeter. So, whether you will be having an entrance length of 4 to 6 centimeter in a channel of length 100 centimeter, it does not matter. On the other hand, if you look into the, the entrance length for mass transfer boundary layer, what is the entrance length? It will be 0 0.05 Reynolds time Smith, Smith number and what is Smith number? Mu by rho d. Now, this becomes very interesting. Now, we are talking about solutes which will be having a higher molecular weight okay, for separation in these cases. Higher molecular weight means they will be having lower diffusivity and their diffusivity will be in the order of 10 to the power minus 11 meter square per second. That is the typical, the maximum diffusivity we can think of of any solute 
under in the in the present world is of monovalent salt that is sodium chloride 10 to the power minus 9 meter square per second that is the maximum diffusivity. If you increase the molecular weight diffusivity decreases for the proteins we can have a diffusivity in the order of 10 to the power minus 11 meter square per second. So, therefore, the and uh, let us say if you, uh, if you if you consider the viscosity will be in the order of let us say water viscosity 10 to the minus 3 Pascal second and density is roughly the water density. So, mu by rho becomes the uh, the kinematic viscosity it becomes 10 to the power minus 6. So, it becomes 10 to the minus 6 into 10 to the minus 11. So, it becomes 10 to the 5. So, it will be speed number will be order of 5. If speed number will be in the order of 10 to the power 5, this becomes the, the entrance length becomes substantial in this case. The entrance length can be as high as as high as 80 centimeter or higher. So, if you talk about a channel of 100 centimeter, 150 centimeter, let us say to 2 meter and half of it 50 percent is the entrance length, then it is substantial. Now, if you do not calculate or incorporate the permeate flux in the entrance length that is coming out, which will be the maximum, then obviously, you are going to under predict the permeate flux. So, that is the that is the first and foremost you know important uh, drawback of film theory, because in the film theory we are considering the the, the uh, portion of the channel length where the mass transfer <coughs> boundary layer will be constant that means fully developed region which will be ol only occurs at the later half of the channel. Now, film so, so film theory can be can be incorrect in the case of ultrafiltration where we are talking about separation of protein, but it will be it will be quite close to the correct value when we are talking about separation of the salt which will be having very high uh, you know, uh, diffusivity in the order of 10 to the power minus 9. So, film theory will be giving more or less correct estimation of productivity in case of reverse osmosis and nano filtration or in case of ultra filtration and micro filtration where we are talking about separation of the solutes of, of, of proteins of, of, the, of the solutes which will be having a molecular weight uh, uh, quite high and low diffusivity in the order of 10 to the power minus 10 or 10 to the power minus 11, then film theory will be giving you inaccurate prediction or under prediction. So, let us define the utility re regime of using of film theory suitable for RO NF under predicts for UF or MF, okay, ultra filtration and micro filtration. Now, okay, having uh, keeping these the limitations of the film theory, let us look into the film theory. Okay. Uh, at the state, we are talking about the steady state only, because most of the operations are done in steady state. There are three fluxes towards the membrane surface, one is the permeate flux, uh, one is the, the convective flux J times C, J is the volumetric permeate flux. Volumetric permeate flux and this is the mass transfer boundary layer with thickness delta. Delta is the thickness of mass transfer boundary layer or concentration boundary layer and volumetric flow rate is J and the concentration is C p. So, volumetric flow rate times concentration will give you the uh, flux of the solute flux towards the membrane. Now, J is the volumetric permeate flux and we are assuming the thickness of mass transfer boundary layer will be extremely small. If you remember from the transport phenomena, delta is inversely is proportional to Smith number, maybe Smith number is to the power 1 upon 3. So, therefore, for these cases, uh, we are we are talking about high Smith number, right, 10 to the power 5. So, therefore, the thickness of mass transfer boundary layer will be extremely small. So, we can safely assume that the velocity field that in within the mass transfer boundary layer in the transverse direction that means in the y direction will be more or less same but in opposite sign compared to the uh, uh, permeate permeation velocity in the permeate side okay so 
there, so let us look into the identify the various fluxes at the steady state towards the membrane. One is convective flux of the solute towards the membrane because of the pressure gradient. Another is the diffusive flux away from the membrane because the membrane surface concentration will be higher because the presence of concentration polarization and concentration gradient within the boundary layer. The there will be backward diffusion from the membrane surface towards the bulk. So this is a Fickian diffusion minus d dc dy. Okay, and a convective flux in the permeate side. So, there will be three fluxes present and we will just identify them J times C convective solute flux, this will be having a unit kg per meter square second solute or, or kilo mole per meter square second solute flux towards membrane. JCP convective solute flux away from membrane and minus D DC DY, it is the diffusive solute flux. A from membrane. Okay. Now, at the steady state, these three fluxes summation of these three fluxes will be equal to 0. J s stands for the solute flux. Summation of these three fluxes will be equal to 0, that gives the governing equation of uh, of of the of uh, you know productivity in the system. What is that? Just add them up. J C minus of minus d d c d y minus J C P will be equal to zero. So J times C minus C P plus d d c d y will be equal to zero. So, you can get the governing equation of concentration d c d y will be equal to minus j by d c minus c p. We separate the variables d c by c minus c p will be minus j by d d y okay. and integrate over the thickness of mass transfer boundary layer from 0 to delta. Let us say delta is the thickness of mass transfer boundary layer and on 0 means on the membrane surface the concentration is c m and at the edge of boundary layer there is a delta c is equal to c naught. So, this gives you l n c naught minus c p divided by c m minus c p is equal to minus j delta by d. So, you will be getting c m minus c p by c naught minus c p uh, l n of that is equal to j d by delta is nothing but the mass transfer film mass transfer coefficient. So, j is equal to k ln C m minus C p divided by C naught minus C p. This is known as famous film theory equation. Okay. So, if you somehow can estimate membrane surface concentration if you can know the permeate concentration either by experiment or theoretically and you know the feed concentration and if you can if you know how to estimate the mass transfer coefficient uh, you can estimate the value of permeate flux. Okay. Now, before going into the detailed calculation now how to solve this equation how to estimate the membrane surface concentration I would like to um, uh, uh, discuss something about the mass transfer coefficient. Because the expression of mass transfer coefficient is quite relevant and quite important in carrying out these type of calculations. Okay. Mass transfer coefficients for estimation of mass transfer coefficient, there are several Sherwood number relations are available. Calculated or estimated, not calculated, estimated from Sherwood number relations.
okay. And obviously, they will be depending on the geometry, they are, they are a function of geometry of the flow channel and uh, you know Reynolds number, Smith number. Reynolds number is basically uh, the turbulence and Smith number is the property of the fluid. And uh, for flow through a tube, the Sherwood number is given as k d by d. This k is the mass transfer coefficient, small d is the diameter of the tube, capital D is the diffusivity of the solute in the system. This becomes 1.62 Reynolds Smith d by L raised to the power 1 upon 3 for laminar flow region. Laminar flow is less than 2100. Okay? And for flow through rectangular channel, the Sherwood relation is K d e by d is equal to 1.86 Reynolds Smith d by L raised to the power 1 upon 3 for the laminar flow region. So, both are is a laminar and they, they, they are known as the Levesque solution. Why they are known as a Levesque solution? Under laminar flow conditions, these relations are derived from the theory only, they are not correlations. Okay. So, they are and the solution is first presented by Levesque, so it is known as the Levesque solution. So, they are not correlation, they are, they are, they are derived from the first principles and they are theoretically derived. D e is the equivalent diameter and I will give you the definition of D after giving the definition of Reynolds number and Smith number. Reynolds number is rho u 0 d e by by mu and Smith number is mu by rho d. Okay. So, rho is basically the density, mu is viscosity of the solution, density of the solution, d is the solute diffusivity in the solution. So, these three are solute solvent property. L in the relation is the length of the channel geometry. Length of the channel. What is equivalent diameter? Equivalent diameter, if you remember the definition of equivalent diameter, it is 4 times weighted area times weighted perimeter. For a tubular member, for a for a tube geometry, the diameter will be the diameter of inner diameter of the tube. For other geometry like rectangular channel, etc., let us say W is the width H is the small height, half height of the channel. Okay. So, we are talking about the equivalent diameter of a rectangular channel. Rectangular channel means there are two plates and flow is occurring between the two plates. Okay. This is the half channel height h, full channel height is 2 h and h, h is the half height of the channel and w is the width of the channel. So, equivalent diameter is 4 times weighted area. What is the weighted area? W times 2 h, the cross section area W times 2 h. And what is the weighted perimeter? Width on both sides and full height on both sides. So, 2 times W plus 2 h. And these types of membrane channels are very thin channels. That means, h will be in the order of 0.1 millimeter. 
on the other hand width will be in the order of 6 to 8 centimeter. Okay. So, therefore, h is uh, in fact 2 h will be much much less than w. So, under this condition d becomes 4 times 2 w h and this becomes 2 w. 2 h will be negligibly small compared to the w itself. So, 2 w 2 w will be cancelled out d will be roughly 4 times half height. So, if you know the half height of the channel that is the geometric specification of the channel you can find out what is the equivalent diameter. Okay. Once you know the equivalent diameter you will be in a position to calculate the Reynolds number you will be in a if you know the uh, you know uh, physical physical properties of the solute and solvent you will be able to know the spit number. So, once you know the spit number once you know the Reynolds number once you know the geometry like half height. Uh, the equivalent diameter of the channel or the inner diameter of a tube and if you know the length of the channel or length of the tube you will be in a position to calculate the Sherwood number or mass transfer coefficient under laminar flow conditions. In fact, uh, for the turbulent flow conditions and for the start cells because the uh, most of the cases the start cells are very, very important as the module for the start cell different mass transfer relations or Sherwood number relations are available using those relations we will be able to find out the estimate the mass transfer coefficients and we can utilize them in order to find out the uh, in order to calculate the permeate flux and permeate concentration. In fact, we have just started it, uh, it will take probably one more class to uh, wind out wind, wind up the uh, how, how the first generation model is utilized to predict the system performance that we will see in the next class. Okay.